Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am the Loctite, and welcome to the very first episode of Series Squared, where we look at anything and everything that A. I have grown to love, or at least appreciate, and B. Has more than one outing within its own IP. As long as something meets these criteria, it might end up on our show. But enough about that. Let us begin. For our first outing, we're going to touch something slightly obscure-ish. A book, or, to be more precise, a trilogy of books penned by one C.S. Lewis. Yes, the Narnia guy. Yes, with the Jesus line. Yes, those books were for children. These books? <laughs> Not so much. Welcome, dear viewer, to C.S. Lewis's The Cosmic Trilogy. And straight off the bat, we have to discuss something that might be slightly touchy for some folks. Religion. You see, Mr. Lewis was Christian. And, unlike his buddy Tolkien, who was born and bred in the stuff, C.S. Lewis was a convert. This meant that his views, in some aspects, were much more profound and quite clearer to be seen in comparison to, say, Lord of the Rings, Deus Ex Eagles notwithstanding. In short, C.S. Lewis's views upon the cosmos were religious, and his works rather strongly reflect that, again, see Jesus' line. So know that we might be touching on slight theological territories during this video. Please be considerate in the comments section. Also, a word of warning. I will be discussing the entire trilogy of books, so there are massive spoilers ahead. I can only say that I enjoyed the books and suggest them as a read to anyone who is okay with a bit of scientific inaccuracy and a rather hefty dose of classical religious viewpoints wrapped in sci-fi, intrigued, symbolism and, surprisingly, authorium folklore. You have been warned. Now then, our journey begins in Out of the Silent Planet with three gentlemen, Elwyn Ransom, Professor Weston, and Dick Devine. Quite by chance, Ransom, who is your average philologist on a countryside tour, is drugged, stuffed in a spaceship, and kidnapped by Weston and Devine, the three of them traveling to a world known only, for the duration of the first book at least, as Malacandra. The book details Ransom's adventures on Malacandra, who was originally meant to be a sacrifice for the local race called the Sorn. More on that later. He escapes almost as soon as they land on the planet, finds the world surprisingly more habitable than he originally thought, meets up with not one but three alien races, all who speak the same language, and are more akin to fantastical creatures than sci-fi monstrosities. They are also rather diverse. The Sorn, for example, are long, pale, elegant giants, not to mention great philosophers, while the otter-like Cross are masters of poems and songs and so on. Out of the Silent Planet relies on attempting to give the sense of childlike wonder as the world slowly opens up around Ransom. The world is thought out in a good amount of detail, but this is where we can see some narrative tension getting somewhat lost. The journey is more of an eye-opening trip into the world the book creates, so the main conflict, Weston, Divine, and the Sorn looking for Ransom, while never vanishing completely, is shoved somewhat into the background. Of course, in the end, it turns out that the entire journey taken leads Ransom to the very place he wanted to avoid. The meeting place of all three races, where they talk to their... well... where they talk to what could be called their resident god of sorts. You see, the world of the Cosmic Trilogy works as thus. The universe is filled with creatures, beings that travel beyond the speed of light. They swim through it, around it. They are called the Eldeal. Technically, they are the angels of the series. They bathe in the eternal glory of God, who's called Maladil in this case, and each planet is assigned one of these creatures whose task it is to safeguard and guide the planet. They are called Oyarsa in these cases, and are the guardian aspects and representations of the world they govern. They work in harmony, unified in the glorious light, except... For one planet. That's right, Earth has, as always, gotten a shaft as its guardian angel started to go... strange. He became hungry for power, and as such, Earth became a dark, cold planet, silent in the sea of light and harmony. It is, to the rest of the universe, Tulakandra, the silent planet. And for a while, the cosmos toiled on, Earth closed away from the rest of the world, until two very important things occurred. One, people sensitive to religion, cover your ears, Jesus happened. Yep, 
This book merges Christianity with the true power behind the universe, or, well, at least anything connected directly to Jesus. That was Maladiel made manifest, his attempt to break through the barricade that our Oyarsa built around the world. Two, we broke the barrier by Weston, a pawn of the guardian of this silent planet, creating the spaceship. Weston wished to further humanity as a species. He does not believe in the importance of the individual, only the use of what said individual can add to the cause. While Divine, the other pawn, believes in cash. One wishes to allow humanity to fester across the cosmos, devouring all, the other wants a cut of the profit. Yet their greed and lust is what allows the silent planet to open up once again, which will be critical in the following books. Now then, back to the plot. It was the Oyarsa of Malakandra that had asked, through the Sorn, to meet with a human. He was obviously intrigued by the creatures. Weston and Divine, however, not believing any religious mumbo-jumbo that the locals had said, and not talking the language well enough to understand it anyways, believed that they were asked for a sacrifice. And so they brought one. In the end, Ransom gets to talk to the Oyarsa of Malakandra. He is offered friendship and a bond that nothing can break, and a hint that he might be called upon to aid in conquering back Earth eventually. Weston and Divine show up tied like a turkey and are briefly humiliated before they and Ransom are unceremoniously stuck back into the spaceship and shot back to Earth, the Oyars are so disgusted with the two that he will not suffer another human on his planet any longer than necessary. And so ends Book One. Out of the Silent Planet is a wonderful book for anyone who enjoys any combination of philosophy, theology, and sci-fi world-building. It is not, however, a very good book for the modern-age action lover. The pacing, as mentioned before, is a bit hit and miss, but it does make up for that in some rather human reactions coming from the characters in regards to what is occurring to them. In the end, this book has an interesting tale about humans in an alien world with alien creatures, so it can be, without a problem, called a sci-fi. For us, it also holds the keystones, for example, the cosmic order, life on solar planets, the great siege of Earth coming to an end, etc., etc., that is required for us to lead us into the sequels. These sequels are both quite unique and, in my opinion, most definitely deserve to be read. As such, they will be kept in a slightly more spoiler-free container.